Hey guys I'm Yurizi. This story is all about what if Naruto's body was possessed by the Nine Tails. The Cuba takes advantage of a unique opportunity and possesses Naruto's body. Can the demon cope with the mortal's body? What will happen when Naruto resurfaces? Before we proceed with the story, please like and subscribe to this channel if you liked the video and don't forget to check the description for the other works of the author if you liked the story. Let's start. Chapter 1, A Ray of Hope Naruto The boy in question jerked his head up from the desk and quickly wiped the drool from the corner of his mouth. If you're just going to sleep while you're here, why do you come at all? Sorry, Iruka sensei I'm just tired today. You say that every day. Maybe I'm tired every day. Iruka decided to ignore that last remark, and continued with the lecture on Genjutsu. Some of the students snickered at the blonde boy. Iruka wasn't kidding when he said Naruto did this every day. In fact, Naruto seemed to sleep in class more and more often. Iruka's screeching only kept him awake for about five minutes this time. Naruto. Naruto looked up upon hearing his name. What? he asked wearily, rubbing the sleep from his eyes. He glanced around. Iruka and he were alone. Is it time for recess? Naruto asked, still only half awake. School's out. Oh. Standing up and stretching, Naruto began to gather his things. Is there something you want to talk about? No. All right, but how do you expect to graduate in the exam tomorrow? I don't think you've been awake for more than ten minutes at a time. Have you been practicing your ninjutsu at home? Naruto didn't seem to hear anything. Goodbye, Iruka sensei. He slowly walked out the door, dragging his bag behind him. No one really cares, thought Naruto. Iruka might, but everyone else hates me. I don't know why I go to school, really. I guess it's a habit by now. I hear people talk about suicide, but that would hurt. Maybe not as much as the pie of being alone, but... Naruto arrived at his rundown apartment and opened the door. He never bothered to lock it. Anything he had of value had already been stolen or destroyed by kids, and sometimes even adults, who hated him for reasons he couldn't think of. He had stopped his pranking a year ago. All it did was get him in more trouble, and incite more people to break into his apartment. I don't know if I want to go to the exam tomorrow. Iruka sensei's right. I haven't paid any attention. But I guess it doesn't really matter. It's not like I've ever been able to do any ninjutsu right and no one will practice taijutsu with me, and I don't understand genjutsu at all. Naruto dropped his stuff by the door, closed it, and fell onto the nearby couch, which the previous owners had left. Probably because it wasn't worth hauling it to the landfill. Naruto knew why he slept so often. Nothing hurts when you're asleep. Everything is calm. He was asleep before he hit the couch. Naruto woke up. He hated waking up. He had to come back to reality, where almost everyone he knew, and many he didn't know, hated him with a passion. He glanced at the analog clock hanging lopsided on the wall. 8 o'clock. I guess I might as well try the exam, since I'm already awake. And even if I don't pass, which I probably won't, I can at least use enough energy to get tired enough to sleep. Naruto arrived at the school around 9 o'clock, having taken his time eating and breakfast and getting there. He looked at the camera as the man took his picture. He waited. When it was his turn, he stepped into the room. He saw three men sitting at the far end of the rectangular room, behind a table, each with clipboards, paper, and pencils. He recognized Erika in the middle, but knew only that the other two were staff somewhere at the academy. Stand over there, said the one on the right, gesturing toward an X marked about ten feet in front of the table. Naruto did as he was told. Now, I want you to make at least three clones of yourself using the replication technique, the man continued. You will be graded on their likeness to yourself, their transparency can malformed clones be transparent? I think so, and, of course, on whether you get at least three. You may proceed when you are ready. Naruto formed the seal and molded his chakra. Two clones appeared. One was non-transparent, but its face was a bit off. The second was pale white and was barely visible because it was so transparent. The three men frowned. The man on the right, 
who apparently did all the talking, said, I'm sorry. Better luck next year. Naruto slowly walked out of the second door of the room, going outside. He began to walk to his house. I remember the guy on the right, now, Naruto thought whimsically. He was the guy who moved here from another village. No wonder he was so polite. Because there's no way any of the teachers other than Iruka would be that nice, since they grew up here. But why do all the adults who grew up here hate me? That guy moved here before I quit doing pranks, but he doesn't hate me. Maybe something else I did, but what? Oh well, it doesn't matter. As he was walking home, a man in an alley just to the side of the road whispered, Hey kid, come here. I want to talk to you. Naruto glanced at the man. The guy had white hair, a chunin outfit and huge shuriken on his back. He seemed about Iruka's age. Naruto didn't recognize him from anywhere. Why would I want to do that? I know that your teachers are all hard on you, and that no one will practice with you. Without anyone to help you, you haven't been able to get any better. I'm willing to train you, if you want. Naruto tried to suppress it, but he still felt a little hope. Maybe this guy isn't like the others. Maybe he saw how they treated me, and sees how I haven't done anything to deserve it. Maybe. Okay. The man grinned. All right. By the way, my name is Mizuki. I know you're Naruto. Anyway since you're a bit behind, we're going to have to do some advanced training. I need you to get a scroll from this place for me. They won't let us have it if we ask, because they all hate you, but if you can get it, I can use it to teach you more quickly, Mizuki quickly explained which scroll he needed and where to get it. Meet me north of here at the abandoned shack in the forest at, say, 9 o'clock tonight. Sound good. Naruto nodded. Great. See you then. Mizuki walked off, pleased with the success of his plan so far. Because of the way the villagers treated the boy, this was almost too easy. Naruto couldn't believe it. Someone cares enough to offer to train me. And to do so when it could get him in trouble. There's no way I can pass this up, Naruto thought as he snuck into the guarded building. If there was one thing he was good at, it was staying hidden. He had learned this from countless times of running from others, either because of some prank he pulled, or because of the unknown reason everyone hated him. Got it. Now all I have to do is meet Mizuki Sensei at the shack, in, let's see, an hour. I think I'll just head there now and read it for a bit before he shows up. Chapter 2, Betrayal Naruto sat in the clearing in front of the shack. He had taught himself the shadow replication technique, which was surprisingly easy, since he couldn't do the supposedly easier replication technique, but this next one was hard. This village needs to get better security, he mused as he continued reading the scroll. I waltzed right in there and took this scroll without any problem, and I'm not even a genin. Oh well, it worked out for me, so, whatever. Hey, where are my goggles? I must have left them at home when I was getting ready. Whatever. The Sandime strolled the halls of the same building Naruto thought needed better security. He walked here every night before he went to bed. It was relaxing. Every night he came for a walk. Every night he counted all 43 scrolls arranged along the walls. 23, 24. It was peaceful here. No one guarded this building because that might arouse suspicion about the allegedly mundane scrolls it contained. This way, no one would know of the scroll, scroll 37, he remembered, the scroll of forbidden techniques. 31, 32. No one would bother stealing a scroll of stuff that could be found almost anywhere. And no one knew where it was, except for him and a few others. 36, 37. The sand dime froze. The scroll was gone. He rushed towards the nearest exit to sound the alarm, when he noticed a pair of goggles lying by the doorway. Naruto, why would you do this? And how did you know which one it was? Or did you? You must find Naruto and the scroll, and bring them to me immediately. Yes, Hokage-sama. The hastily gathered ninja shouted in unison, before sprinting in every direction. Naruto turned his head toward the rustling of bushes. Mizuki stood about 20 feet behind him. Right on time. Hey, Naruto. Mizuki-sensei. Here, let me see that scroll. 
Naruto stood up to give it to him, when suddenly, he heard another voice. Don't give it to him, Naruto. Iruko leaped into the clearing, landing between Mizuki and Naruto. What? Why Naruto managed? Was Iruko one of the ones who wished to hold him back? Mizuki was just using you to get that scroll. It is the scroll of forbidden techniques. But I... Mizuki. An evil grin spread over Mizuki's face. Indeed. How could anyone like you? Did you really think that I was going to train you? I hate you, and so does everyone else in the village. Even your precious Iruka sensei Iruka looked about to deny this, but Mizuki continued, I bet no one bothered to tell you, since it would be against the law. The law that was made when you were born. What law? I haven't heard of any law. Of course not. The law goes like this. No one can tell you about the law. And no one can tell you, that the Kyuba no Kitsune is sealed in you. That's why everyone hates you. The Kyuba killed over half of the village's population. Everyone lost at least one family member. Iruka lost both of his parents. And everyone can see the proof of the Kyuba's presence in you, every time they see the whisker marks on your cheeks. Did you really think that any birthmark could be so outrageous? But you bought it. What a loser. You're not getting away with that scroll, Erika said. What? You're going to stop me? Ha. Huh. I'll take care of the demon brat, then I'll take care of you. With that, Mizuki hurled one of his shuriken straight at Naruto, who had moved from behind Erika to better hear Mizuki. Naruto knew he couldn't dodge it. He was too shocked by what he just heard to react that quickly to an attack. He closed his eyes, waiting for the pain, the pain that would end all of his pain, the crunching sound. Naruto opened his eyes. In front of him stood Iruka facing him, with a pained look on his face. Iruka turned to face Mizuki, although he seemed barely able to stand. Then Naruto saw why. The giant shuriken was embedded in Iruka's back. Don't listen to him. Naruto. Iruka gasped. I, don't hate you. You didn't do anything. Now go. Get away before, before. Before what? Mizuki gloated. Before I finish you off? You just gave up any chance you had of beating me. Now that scroll is as good as mine. Mizuki hurled his second giant shuriken at them. Naruto could only stare as it hurtled toward Iruka and him. But Iruka spun around and pushed Naruto out of the way. Only to be decapitated by the shuriken. Naruto stared at what used to be his sensei. Iruka had been killed. The only person who had ever cared about him. The only one who ever listened to him. Rage boiled up inside of him. He killed Iruka sensei. To tell the truth, Naruto, I'm feeling generous today. If you'll give me that scroll, I'll let you live. Then I'll be on my way. You'll be on your way, all right. To hell. Naruto screamed. He picked up the shuriken that had killed Iruka. He killed Iruka sensei Mass shadow replication. 100 clones appeared, surrounding Mizuki. Each one held a shuriken. This is your last chance. Mizuki screamed in terror, hoping against hope that the boy would give up. Maniacal laughter burst from the Naruto's. Mizuki watched in horror as every clone pulled back their shuriken. Time to die, Mizuki sensei. Mizuki saw only shuriken. And then he saw nothing at all. Meanwhile, the ninja returned to the Sandaima to report their findings. All except Iruka. Where's Iruka? Didn't he go to check north in the forest? Someone go find him. Five ninjas sped off to the forest. The five ninjas were stunned at what they saw. A headless Iruka. A bloody pile of shuriken that hid the remains of a body, if the severed hand was any clue. And there was Naruto, lying on the ground, with a blank look in his eyes, muttering something to himself under his breath. The nins approached the child, uncertain as to whether he had done all this or not. Naruto stood up. One of the nins would later swear that the boy's eyes were lifeless holes that sucked the energy from the air around him. The lead nin gestured for Naruto to follow them. He did, in a stiff, mechanical fashion, that made them wonder if he were a puppet. When Naruto was close enough, they could hear what he was saying. He killed Iruka-sensei. 
He killed Iruka Sensei. He killed Iruka Sensei. He killed Iruka Sensei. The San Daime had prepared himself to give a stern lecture to Naruto, but when he saw him, he couldn't bring himself to say it. After he calmed down, Naruto explained what had happened. Although most of the nins in the room were too used to hating him show any sympathy, they saw the pain that Naruto went through every day. They thought he deserved it. Sarutobi decided that there was no need for punishment, and, though many nins disagreed, no one dared to gainsay the Hokage. Naruto went back to his house and collapsed on the bed. No one cares about me, thought Naruto. The only person who ever showed any flicker of kindness was Iruka, and now he's gone. I trusted Mizuki, and he used me for his own gain. No one cares. Naruto drifted into a darkness deeper than sleep. It was unexpected, but he would accept it however it came. It was like watching someone at the Hokage's desk, running everything, getting up and leaving. No one was in control. Could it be possible? Could he have a moment of freedom from his accursed prison? He took control, and opened the eyes, now his eyes, and saw the ceiling of Naruto's room. He glanced at the bedstand. He was in control. The brat had vanished somehow, at least for the moment. There was no way he would pass up this opportunity. At last, thought Kyubi. Chapter 3, Kyubi, Ninja of Kanaha. Kyubi tested Naruto's legs. His legs. They moved. He tried the, his arms. They also moved at his will. He stood up. And promptly fell over. Those humans make it look so easy. He crawled to his hands and knees. He slowly got to his feet. He stood. This takes more concentration than it should. I guess I'll have to get used to it. Hmm. <clears throat> now for walking. Cuba walked to the end of the small room and back. After he got the hang of it, he put clothing on the floor to make it more realistic. After he mastered this, he practiced jumping, which was far harder than he thought at first. He was practicing running through the halls covered with clothing and balls and stuff, when the sun rose. Hmm? That took a long time. What should I do now? I could finish destroying Kanaha. But I should see if I can use my powers in this body first. I'll go to one of the furthest training areas and make sure of what I can do in this body. With that in mind, Kyuba laughed and stepped towards the door. Mwahahaha dash, Kyuba stopped dead in his tracks. My voice. I don't sound like Naruto at all. I sound like the voice of doom. Like, me. I could just dash for the training area, but if someone saw me, and if I couldn't access my power. Drat. To practice his voice, Kyuba decided to see if he was moving his mouth incorrectly. He went into the restroom and turned on the light, only to notice another problem. His eyes. His blood red, slitted eyes. Well, that doesn't look suspicious. What can I do about my eyes? Genjutsu. Even if Naruto had not, Kyuubi had paid attention to the classes, because there was nothing else to do. Not that he minded or anything. So, I concentrate on what I want to disguise, mold the chakra, he molded his chakra, his vision glowed blue, and voila. His eyes were now, purple. Hmm. <laughs> I'm going to have to work on that. Wait. I used Naruto's chakra. How on earth did I do that? Well, I guess since I'm using his body. I need to practice hand seals, and human techniques, and Naruto's voice, and fix my eyes. And what is this feeling in my stomach? Damn humans and their need for food. And their need for water. And restrooms. The mighty Kyuubi, sitting on the crapper. I hate humans. Several hours later, Kyuubi had gotten his mastery of seals beyond what Naruto had before. Did he ever even try? He had practiced a few techniques to make sure he could use Naruto's chakra well. He had softened his voice enough to sound like he had gone through puberty overnight and gotten a cold. The voice still needs a bit of work, but it's acceptable, for now. And his eyes looked only a shade darker than Naruto's. But if someone with any skill looked at them, they would tell there was a genjutsu, though they wouldn't be able to see my eyes. But I need to test my power. I can't go through this with only a human's pathetic power. Suddenly he heard a knocking on the front door. His first instinct was to shoot a giant fireball at it, but
but then he remembered that he didn't want to show his power without testing its effects on this frail human body. Cuba walked to his front door and opened it. Hello, Naruto, said the Sandaima. I realize that you are probably still grieving for Iruka, who? Oh, the brat's sensei. But I wanted to let you know that, since you mastered the shadow replication, I think that you are skilled enough to be a genin. I would like to present you with your forehead protector. Uh, thanks. You will need to come to a meeting in two days, where the graduates will be divided into their teams. It will be in classroom 100C. Good luck. The Sandaime turned and walked away. Dang, I need to get this voice problem fixed. But first, to test my power. If I can use all of my power, I won't need to worry about imitating Naruto. With that thought, Cuba strode towards the training grounds. It looks like he's going to train. It's very unlike him, but it is to our advantage. We will get rid of the demon brat once and for all. The group of 15 villagers followed silently after what they assumed to be Naruto. Kyuubi arrived at the training grounds. Now what should I use as a target? I why are so many villagers coming this way? Ah, they are following me to torment Naruto. They will make good target practice. Kyuubi summoned up his own chakra. To his surprise, it came out of the seal with almost no resistance, although summoning it broke the genjutsu on his eyes. He would have to fix it later. His chakra poured though the seal. The Yondaime wasn't as thorough as he thought. Ha. Huh. We have you now, demon boy. You can't owe my go dash. The man was unable to continue you after his throat was ripped out. Time to die, little humans. Mwahahaha. It felt good to kill again. It had been years since his last kill, and so even these pathetic villagers were good sport. But my chakra was deteriorating Naruto's, my body. My regenerative boost made up for it, but at this rate, I won't be able to summon a quarter of my full power without dying in minutes. There has to be some way to regenerate faster, or protect this body, or to control my chakra outside of the body to keep it from harming the body in the first place. I will have to use it only in small amounts until I can find a way around it. And I think I'm going to have to replace this genjutsu every time I use my chakra for other than healing this body. That's going to be a pain. Having found out what he needed to, Kyuubi headed back to Naruto's house. I need to practice this voice, anyway. Kyuubi managed to adjust his voice, although he noticed that any attempt to disguise his identity was useless if he tried to use any of his demonic chakra outside of Naruto's body. He found that he did not need sleep, as his regenerative effects on his body were more than enough to compensate for sleep deprivation's effects. Except for the bags under the eyes, but they weren't important. Cuba walked into classroom 100C. No one seemed to notice him. They were busy talking among themselves. Not a single person glanced at him, though he heard a few wonder out loud at how Naruto could have passed the exam. Cuba was glad that Naruto had never been popular because now no one should be able to tell the difference. He was a little curious as to where the kid had gone. He could feel a presence in the back of his mind, but it didn't respond to any of his attempts to rouse it. Perhaps that was just as well. In a few minutes, the Chunin who had presided over the exam entered the room. He set his coffee on the desk, but held onto the clipboard which Kyuubi assumed to be the list of teams. Everyone, quiet. I will be dividing you into teams, and Dash the Chunin paused as two more boys sauntered into the room. One was fat and held a bag of potato chips. The other had his hair in a short ponytail. They took seats in the back of the room, and the ponytailed boy seemed to instantly fall asleep. Nice of you to join us, Shikamaru, Choji. As I was saying, after I divide you into teams, you will be leaving with your team leaders, who should be arriving shortly. Team 1 Cuba tuned out the instructor. He would wait until he heard Naruto's name. There was no point in knowing what teams these pathetic humans were on. Until I find a way to use most or all of my power, I'm going to have to rely on Naruto's abilities. I can only fight with up to a quarter of my power, and that only for a few minutes. If I can get this body to be fast enough, though, a quarter could be sufficient. But still. Team 7. Uzumaki Naruto. Harano Sakura. Uchiha Sasuke. 
The pink-haired girl on one side of a black-eyed boy jumped up with a squeal of delight, while the blonde one on the other side wailed with despair. How strange. Your Jounin leader will be Hatake Kakashi. That concludes the list. Is there anyone who was not called? Good. You may leave with your instructors whenever they arrive. Everyone got up and began to leave. Everyone except Team 7. The pink-haired genin who Kyuubi understood to be Harano Sakura began to complain. Where is Kakashi-sensei? He better not be late. But I guess I get to be alone with, uh. She blushed furiously, darting a glance at the scowling, raven-haired boy. Kyuubi was about to ask if he didn't count as a person, but thought better of it. The less I speak, the fewer chances I take of being recognized. I guess if we have to wait here, I can let this body sleep, since I can't really train here. Sasuke saw Naruto slump onto the table. What a dope. I don't know how he managed to stay awake for the team divisions, but I knew it couldn't last long. He smirked. Fine with me. I don't need his help. We'll do just fine as long as he stays out of the way. But, how did he pass? I heard that he failed the exam. Whatever. I don't care. Hey, um, Sasuke, maybe after we meet the instructor, we could eat lunch together. No. Sakura looked crestfallen. But we're going to be on the same team, so we need to get to know each other, and so I thought that dash. Then have lunch with Naruto. Don't be ridiculous. I might as well eat with a rock. Then eat with a rock. There's no need to be so rude. Sakura whirled around so Sasuke wouldn't see the tears gathering in her eyes. Two hours later. The door to their left opened, and a white-haired Jounin calmly strode into the room. He had both of his hands in his pockets, and his left eye was covered by a sagging forehead protector. The rest of his face from the bridge of his nose down was obscured by a mask. Sorry I'm late, guys. I got lost on the way here. What a pathetic excuse. You live here. Have you no shame? Sakura's outburst woke Kyuubi and stirred Sasuke from his brooding. I take it that you are Kakashi-sensei, Sasuke stated. Yes I am. Meet me on the roof. We'll talk more when you all get there. Kakashi disappeared in a cloud of smoke of leaves. What are we waiting for? Let's go. Sakura ran outside. Kyuubi followed slowly, and Sasuke followed even more slowly. This is a bad sign, thought Sasuke. Chapter 4, Kyuubi, Thief Kakashi watched as the pink-haired girl jumped up to the roof quickly, followed by the two, obviously lazier, boys. If they plan to be that lazy during the bell exercise, they are in for a surprise. Sakura sat down right in front of him, smiling. Sasuke walked over and sat on her right, scowling at some inner thought. Naruto sat behind and to the left of Sakura, and stared at the roof. Naruto doesn't seem very confident in himself. He won't even look me in the eye. We'll have to work on that. Sasuke is no doubt contemplating revenge. Well, as long as he doesn't do anything rash about it, he should be okay. Kakashi kept these thoughts to himself. All right, everyone. I am your Jounin instructor. Let's take turns telling each other our names, things you like, hobbies, dreams, and stuff like that. Why don't you go first, sensei, and show us what you mean? Asked Sakura, wanting to know more about their strangely attired sensei. Sasuke was glad she asked, as he also wanted to know about Kakashi, but didn't want to ask. Of course, he expressed no gratitude to Sakura. Gratitude was for weaklings. He couldn't be weak. He was an avenger. Kyuubi just sat there, and continued staring at the roof. I bet this human would notice the genjutsu on my eyes if I looked up. Maybe he'll assume Naruto is just depressed or something, and I won't have to look at him, Kyuubi thought. Very well. My name, as you probably know, is Hatake Kakashi. My hobbies are. I like certain things. I dream about different stuff, yeah. You go next, Sakura. All we really learned was his name, Sakura whispered to her teammates. They both ignored her. A little miffed, Sakura said out loud, My name is Harano Sakura. I like. She glanced at Sasuke and blushed. 
My hobbies are talking with friends and picking flowers. My dream is to be a great ninja and marry a nice guy, and... Again, she glanced at Sasuke and blushed. You go next, Sasuke, Kakashi said, sounding bored. My name is Uchiha Sasuke. I like being strong and respected. My hobby is training. My dream is to kill a certain man. Just as I suspected, thought Kakashi. Naruto, you're up. Kyuubi continued plumbing the depths of the roofing tile in front of him. He couldn't risk looking up. My name is... Uzumaki Naruto. I can't believe I almost told them my actual name. That would be an embarrassing way to be found out. I like, ramen. It sounded like a question. I should have paid more attention to the kid before now. My hobby is, sleeping, I guess. My dream. I don't know. And to think this is the kid who used to shout about becoming Hokage. I didn't know the villagers were so mean. Or maybe Eureka's death was hard on him. But I can't go easy on him just because of that. Good. We'll meet tomorrow at training area 7 at 6 a.m. Don't eat breakfast. Why? Asked Sakura. Because you'd throw up. Kakashi vanished in a cloud of smoke. So, would you like to eat lunch with me, Sasuke? No. Why? I'm busy. Oh. Sasuke walked to the edge of the roof and dropped to the ground before continuing towards his house. Sakura followed him. Sasuke? Is it okay if I walk with you for a while? Whatever. Sakura smiled, while inner Sakura babbled about true love and such things. Kyuba waited until they were out of sight. Once he was sure they were gone, he ran to what he now referred to as his training area. He needed to build speed to make up for his lack of power. And, he touched the tree at the far east end of the training area, and began sprinting back to the west end. The sun was just beginning to peek from behind the horizon, casting his elongated shadow ahead of him. As he ran, he jumped onto or over the rocks and logs he came across. His muscles should have been burning after sprinting for an hour without stopping except to change directions, but his quick rate of regeneration allowed him to continue. There's got to be a better way to get faster, Kyuba thought. I'll have to stop soon. This body is running out of energy. It's a good thing I feed it more than just ramen. Those rabbits were good. But this takes too long. I won't be able to hide my presence forever. But the only way I see of safely using my power is through ninja means, which I need to learn from ninja, which means I have to stay here and do missions and crap. It's fortunate that I do not require sleep. One more length and I'll go find some meat. Maybe a deer, if I can find one. Then Kyuubi heard a voice. And if I cannot complete all 500 laps around Kanaha, I shall do 500 push-ups. What on earth? Kyuubi went to see who was so vibrantly enthusiastic. He stopped at the edge of the forest. He saw an older man and a boy he recognized as one of the graduates from last year, both dressed in what appeared to be green leotards. Kyuubi rolled his eyes. 500 laps. They are either crazy, or dead serious about training. Can you tell the difference the weights have made in your training, Lee? You burn brightly with the flames of youth. Of course you have. And once we increase them for the third time, I will teach you an awesome technique. Thank you, Gai-sensei. What is this technique you speak of? I must know. I will tell you when. The two ran out of Kyubia's hearing. Weights. That's it. If I train with weights, I can improve in less time. But what could I use as weights? Kyuubi thought about different things he could do for weights while he hunted for food. I'll eat anything other than ramen. Kyuubi returned to Naruto's house just before sunset. He knew that even if he didn't sleep, this body needed at least short periods of inactivity. He watched the sun go down, slowly sinking below the horizon. In the end, the only way Kyuubi had thought he could get something small enough and heavy enough to use would be to get weights designed for training purposes. But Naruto was poor, and there was no way he could afford to buy them. And I need better clothes than this flower's scent orange outfit. And I don't want to ask for things, I can't take a chance of being caught. Who'd have thought, Kyuubi no Kitsune, hiding from mere mortals. But then, since my life is tied to this body by that accursed seal, that makes me mortal as well. 
I guess I'll have to steal. But I can't exactly steal clothing and wear it in broad daylight. I'm going to have to steal money and buy clothing. And the weights, I can't have questions asked about them if anyone notices them. This could be difficult in a village of ninja. And I don't know of any nearby towns. Kuso. Cuba dressed in the only dark clothing Naruto had ever owned, navy sweatpants and a black t-shirt. He used a ninjutsu made specifically for hiding in the dark. It was the third and last technique Naruto had learned from the Forbidden Scroll. Though it was meant for hiding, it would serve to camouflage him for his nighttime raid. He formed the seals and molded his chakra. Light absorption technique, Kyuubi remembered. His skin, hair, nails, and every part of his body turned black. Despite the seemingly illusory effect, it was indeed classified as ninjutsu. Kyuubi knew why. It requires hand seals, unlike genjutsu. And it causes the body to absorb light, thus turning this body black. Because it isn't genjutsu, it isn't easily detected. No one would you be looking for ninjutsu, because those aren't normally used for stealth. It was dark enough now. Kyuubi opened the only functioning window in Naruto's house, and was about to jump out, when he realized something. He didn't know where he should steal from. He needed to steal money. A bank would have money, but would be heavily guarded. I guess I'll just rob several stores. Kyuubi mentally reviewed the Nibi stores. Which ones would he have time to hit? A grin spread across Kyuubi's face. He formed a seal. Shadow replication technique. Five clones came into being. Kyuubi used the light absorption technique on each of them, and outlined his plan. The clones nodded, then jumped out the window. Kyuubi followed suit. Although he could hear the clones leaping towards their targets, he was unable to see them. They would be invisible, or nearly so, as long as they stayed away from lights. Kyuubi ran to his own destination, which would be slightly harder to rob than where any of the clones were bound. They were going to rob a grocery store, two convenience stores, and two clothing stores. He would be robbing a jeweler's. He landed on the ground beside a toy store. On the other side of the store was the jeweler's. He couldn't risk making too much noise by jumping around over there. He snuck around back, and saw Tuchin in standing guard at the back door. Of course they would have ninja guarding it. This is a ninja village. I thought my only problem would be patrolling ninja, but what can I do now? Is there anyone guarding the front door? Cuba slunk back around the toy store, and peeked around the front corner. A single Chunin stood under a street light. That won't work. I can't get caught in any light. Guess I'll have to work around the two in the back. Kyuubi crept back around the toy store. He heard the Chunin talking in low voices. He couldn't fight them. Without any of his powers. He'd be outmatched in seconds. With the fraction of his powers he had available, he would glow and be recognized. Besides, a fight of any length would almost certainly be loud, and the Chunin could call for backup. If he could get them away for just a minute or two, he might be able to pick the lock on the back door or something. But how could he get them to move? They weren't chun in for nothing. Cuba thought for a moment. Then, he had an idea. Chapter 5, Cuba, Murderer Author's note, on another note, it was brought to my attention that I was unclear on what happened to Naruto. He unconsciously retreated into his mind, and is currently in the halls slash sewers where Kyuubi's cage is. Kyuubi is controlling the body by leaking chakra through the bars of the cage out to whatever place in that area allows people there to control the body. That's my theory on that. Naruto is currently unaware of anything, but will regain consciousness and become aware of where he is at a later point. Hey. Kyuubi waited patiently for the clones to get into position. Once the Chunin left their posts, he would have limited time to get the cash before the clones were dispatched. He peeked into his front pocket. Good. I have that navy cloth bag with me. There's no knowing how much money there could be in a jewelry store. And any moment now. I can't believe I pulled guard duty here twice this week, Toru. I have stuff I have to do during the day, you know. The chin inside as he continued to lean against the wall. Oh well. At least we can talk to each other, Ichigo. The guy out front is probably bored out of his mind, the second Chunin replied. It's easy money, though, it's not like anything ever dash. 
He was interrupted by a clang that could only be Kunai colliding in midair. He and his partner rushed out into the street where the noise had come from. They saw four Kanahachanins fighting furiously against six enemies, who didn't seem to be wearing forehead protectors. None of the nin seemed able to hit each other. The guard from the front of the store came around the corner. He looked at the other two. All three nodded simultaneously, and joined the fray. Cuba tried to open the back door. Locked. How on earth would he be able to open the door quietly? His clones weren't making much noise because they couldn't hit each other. Then he saw it. Fire regulations required that all exit doors open outwards. Therefore, the hinges were in the outside. He put the tip of his kunai under the bolt of the hinge, trying to use it as a lever to force the bolt up. Just before Kyuubi gave up, the bolt jerked up about an inch. Kyuubi pulled the bolt out, and repeated the process on the other two hinges. He caught the door as it began to fall backwards, and set it gently onto the ground. The last thing he needed was for the heavy metal door to give him away after he had gone to all of this trouble. He snuck into the shop. Toru threw a kunai at an enemy nin, who easily dodged it. It seemed that the only purpose kunai now possessed was to distract good ninja or injure the incompetent. He followed it up with two more. He saw the guard from the front throw a kunai at the same ninja. With any luck, it wouldn't be noticed. But luck wasn't with them. A second enemy nin deflected the third kunai with his own. This might take longer than I had hoped, thought the Toru, as he dodged a spray of kunai. After searching for far longer than he thought wise, Cuba finally found the safe. It had been disguised as a trash can behind the counter. Seeing that it was the cheap kind with the plastic combination wheel, he punched through said wheel and grabbed as much cash as he could lay hands on. He stuffed what he could into his pockets, and put the rest into the bag he had brought. If worst came to worst, he could abandon the bag, and still get away with a good sum of money. Especially since he saw the large denominations of the bills. This was, of course, a jewelry store. Once he finished, he carefully placed the safe back where it had been. If he was careful, and if the clones held out long enough, he could also replace the door, and his theft wouldn't be discovered until much later. Kyuubi hurried to the back door. He should have checked the place out before but it hadn't occurred to him. He was a demon, who should have been able to just blast the village to hell, instead of sneaking around at night to get supplies. He picked up the door and placed it back into the door frame. Now was the real problem. How to quietly get the bolts back into place. Ichigo saw that the enemy nin had no visible forehead protectors. They were probably on an undercover mission when they were spotted by these other chunin. Oddly enough, I don't recognize any of the chunin, but then, there are a lot of us. Although his enemies seemed to work well as a team, they were reduced mostly to dodging kunai and dancing away from the Kanaha ninja. They hardly got a single attack off after the guards had intervened. Ichigo saw that the nin seemed unnaturally afraid of being hit. He saw numerous openings made by the other Kanaha chunin that these nin could have exploited by taking a punch or two, but the anonymous ninja refused to take any action which put themselves in harm's way. What cowards! But perhaps it is a trick to wear us out. Perhaps they have great endurance. But as quiet as the fight is, surely someone will notice and show up. His musing was proven true when Akanaha Jounin showed up. Ichigo recognized him, but couldn't think of a name. The Jounin stayed out of the sight of the enemy nin, until he suddenly leaped out of the shadow of a nearby building, flinging kunai at three ninja. Two of the nin dodged the kunai, but the third was just a hair slow and was grazed across the arm. This shouldn't have been a big deal, but Ichigo was startled when he saw the nin vanish in a puff of smoke. He looked at the ground where the nin had been. Sure enough, there were footprints. A bunch in couldn't make footprints. Unless it was an advanced form. With a start, he realized that any bunch in of that caliber would be at least Jounin level. With the clone's demise, the other five nin sprang into attack. But curiously, they jumped past the unknown Kanaha Chunin to attack the guards and the Jounin. Two went for the Jounin, while each Chunin was faced with one. They nin emptied their kunai pouches at them in mid-jump and prepared to fight hand to hand. The Jounin threw two well-aimed kunai at his assailants and dodged the kunai thrown at him. Because they were in the air, they had no chance of dodging the kunai aimed for the center of their bodies. The kunai sunk deep into their chests. 
Then the nin promptly disappeared in puffs of smoke. The Jounin smirked. Just as I thought. Confident that the remaining seven Chunin would handle the last three attackers, the Jounin listened for the real perpetrator. The clones were obviously a diversion for something else in the vicinity. Then he felt something strange. A Genjutsu. It's in the jewelry store. No, just behind it. The Jounin began to run in that direction, only to stop after a few steps. What is the meaning of this? He shouted. Cuba was at a loss for how to replace the bolts. He couldn't hammer them into place. Suddenly he heard the characteristic poof of a clone being dispelled. He needed to hurry. Thinking quickly, he decided to just shove the bolts as far in as he could, and hope no one noticed. He heard another two poofs in quick succession. Kuso. Another ninja must have shown up. He crammed the second bolt into the hinge. He heard a voice cry, what is the meaning of this? He realized that his fake Kanahan in must have interfered with what sounded to be an older ninja. The voice sounded older than the Chunin he had heard. It probably belonged to a Jounin. But he had specifically ordered the clones not to interfere unless. Kuso. I've been discovered. That guy must be a Jounin for sure. Why does this have to happen to me? Cuba decided not to think about the obvious reason having to do with his robbing a jewelry store. The Jounin was confused and angry. These Chunin had gotten in his way, and were staring at him while the other Chunin fought was were surely clones. And why did the clones pass these Chunin to? They're clones too. The Jounin saw the Kanaha Chunin pull out their kunai. Am I going to have to fight all four of them? Suddenly three kunai flew from the right, hitting three clones. The real Chunin had finished with the clones, since one hit dispelled them. That left one very lonely clone, who threw his remaining kunai and crouched in preparation for the inevitable attack. The Jounin dodged the poorly aimed kunai and attacked. He swung his leg for a roundhouse kick. Even if the clone blocked it, the it would dispelled. To the Jounin's surprise and dismay, the clone's creator was apparently a flexible person, since the clone bent backwards nearly to the ground, picked up a kunai behind him, and stabbed it deep into back of the Jounin's thigh. The Jounin grunted in pain, but followed through with a quick punch which dispelled the last clone. The Jounin walked quickly to the Chunin, who seemed winded and sporting various shallow cuts, but relatively unharmed, and knocked each of them roughly in the chest. Good, none of them are clones. You, Chunin, stay here and be on the lookout for any more threats. With that, he sprinted as fast as his injury permitted towards the back of the store. Kyuubi rammed the last bolt halfway into the hinge. That will have to be good enough. I need to leave quickly. He heard three poofs. Make that very quickly. Kyuubi took off down the back alley. He needed to move quickly and stealthily, so that meant taking the alley that ran behind all of the stores. But if someone from the fight looked back here, they would see him. He heard a final poof and then he heard the sound of someone with a slight limp sprinting after him. As he rounded the corner, he glanced back, and since his pursuer was dressed differently than the Chunin he had seen, he realized that it must be the late ninja, whom he assumed was a Jounin. Kuso. Now I'll have to lose him in the village or the forest. But how could he have detected me? Kyuba thought for a moment as he ran towards the nearest edge of the forest. The Genjutsu. Of course. I was smart enough to use ninjutsu to hide, but forgot to remove the genjutsu I already had. Kyuubi quickly disabled the genjutsu and jumped onto a rooftop, and then into the forest. The Jounin ran as fast as he could while trying not to worsen the injury on his leg. He could run, but it was painful with a kunai sticking in his hamstrings. Although he knew that running with it in would make the injury a bit worse, running after pulling it out would make him bleed to death so he could run at about 75 of his normal speed. It wasn't fast enough to catch up to the ninja, but it was enough to keep him from getting away. Soon he noticed that it was incredibly hard to see the ninja, and the genjutsu that had alerted him to the nin's presence had apparently been removed. The nin had black hair, dark clothing, and appeared to have black paint or dye covering every inch of exposed skin. And, it has to be paint or dye or something, because there is not a single black person anywhere in Naruto. How weird. Although his Jounin training allowed him to see the Nin anyway, he was annoyed at how difficult it was. He saw the Nin run into the forest. 
Pulling out a stick, he set off a flare to alert others to his position and need of reinforcements. Then he followed the mysterious ninja into the forest. Cuba was surprised when he noticed a flash of light behind him. He glanced back. A flare. Can't anything go right today. He was going to have to ditch the Jounin before reinforcements arrived. As much as he had improved his speed, he knew that the Jounin's injury was the only thing that kept him from catching up. If I can make several clones, then I might be able to escape. Yeah. Then no. He caught me because of the Genjutsu. I have to use it while I'm in the village. Kuso. I'm going to have to kill a Jounin to keep this a secret. Ducking behind a tree, Cuba made four clones and used the light absorption technique on them so that they matched his appearance. He jumped into the higher branches, and sent three of the clones to attack while keeping the fourth behind to act as a decoy. He couldn't do this for much longer, since he was almost out of Naruto's chakra. And he couldn't risk using his own chakra without alerting every skilled ninja to the presence of his demonic chakra. Then he wouldn't be able to use it in front of anyone ver again. Or worse, they might remember that Naruto had a demon sealed inside of him. They hated him enough as it was. He crouched on the branch as his clones attacked. I'm never going to catch up at this rate, thought the Jounin. He kept pace with the Nin, but every leap from one tree to the next made the kunai slice a little deeper into his leg. Already, he was forced to favor his right leg, which was bleeding around the kunai. He probably should have set off the flare and tried to do first aid on his leg, but he couldn't let such a potentially dangerous enemy leave unchallenged. He saw the Nin duck behind a tree. Was the Nin foolish enough to hope that he, a Jounin, wouldn't notice that? Three shapes that he assumed were clones leapt out and drew their kunai. Apparently not. The Jounin saw a bit of movement behind the tree. The Nin wasn't willing to risk himself. Or maybe he was waiting to launch sneak attack. He threw three kunai at each of the clones. They dodged easily, and kept coming. The clones jumped at him, threw two kunai each, then drew a third. They held these in a way the Jounin knew meant close combat. He dodged five of the kunai, but his injury prevented him from Isakping the sixth, which stuck out of the bicep of his right arm. Great, now I can't use my good arm, and I'm going to be in close quarters. Drawing two kunai, he blocked two wild swings from two clones, and moved his head enough to avoid an attempt at stabbing his face. Spinning around, he faked a melee attack, then threw his kunai at two clones. One dodged, but the other poof ed into nothingness. I wasn't given the rank of Jounin for nothing. He saw the real Nin step out from behind the tree and begin throwing kunai. These were easily dodged, but it was becoming more and more difficult as the two remaining clones pressed their attack and as his leg and arm continued to bleed. He threw a single kunai at the real Nin, and jumped backwards out of in the reach of the two clones' ferocious attack. The kunai probably wouldn't even hit the Nin, but it would stop him from throwing kunai for a few seconds. He perched on a high branch and began the seals for the grand fireball technique. Not only will it dispel the clones if they are too slow, it will alert any help to my location. He came to the last seal and brought his hand to his mouth. He took a deep breath, feeling the chakra gather in his lungs. Then he died. Cuba pulled the kunai out of the back of the Jounin's head. The body fell to the ground 40 feet below. The Jounin had been so intent on avoiding the clones and the throne kunai that he had failed to think that the real Nin might have also been a clone. Crap, I need to hide the body. But where? Cuba thought for a moment. He couldn't bury it. That would take too long and could be discovered. Maybe I could disguise it to look like something else. Mizuki's body. They never got rid of it, something about not defiling our honor by burying a triator. I can cut up the body and hide it in with Mizuki's remains. The two clones who had been fighting picked up the body and ran with Naruto towards Mizuki's final resting place. The third clone trailed a ways behind, making sure that they were not followed. I'm sorry, Hokage-sama, but that is all we were able to determine. The Sandai mess sighed. Early this morning, he had been besieged with reports of robberies from all kinds of small stores. And then there was the matter of the jewelry store robbery ending with three slightly wounded Chunin, and a missing Jounin. The Umbu had been able to find where the flare had been set off, and had rushed into the forest, 
following the trail of blood to a place where the trees had shown evidence of a battle. There was no clue as to who won, or what happened, but the Jounin had not returned, and with the amount of blood they found on the trail, he probably would have died even if he had been victorious. But there was no body. They had followed a smaller trail of blood which led to Mizuki's corpse, and found several wild dogs eating there. They had assumed that the mysterious jewel robber had won, and the remains the dogs were eating were the Jounins. They theorized that the body had been brought to Mizuki's corpse by the wild dogs, since that was now the apparent lair of this pack. Be on the lookout for any other attempts. I want double guards for the next two weeks at their assigned places, and five more Jounins to patrol the streets. If there is any sign of trouble, use a flare immediately. We don't want to lose another ninja because he or she thinks they can handle it alone. Does everyone understand? The ninja in the room nodded. Good. And if anyone finds any evidence related to any of last night's thefts, bring it to my attention immediately. It could have been a coordinated strike, and there was only a disturbance at the jewelers because of the guards. You are dismissed. The ninja filed out of the room. Chapter 6, The Bell Test Kyuba knew that Naruto was hated by the villagers, but he figured that they would at least take his money when he tried to buy something. I guess Naruto was fortunate that someone else bought his food. If Naruto had been left to buy food, he'd have starved. Kyuba had planned to buy something before meeting his team this morning, but he had been thrown out of every clothing store he had tried to go in. And he hadn't dared to try and enter the store with the weights after seeing the glare the owner gave him. Kyuba needed to buy the stuff himself to avoid raising suspicion, but no one would sell to him. Perhaps a henge, but no. Then they would think I stole it from whoever I hunged into. Kuso. Kyuba mused about his activities this night as he walked to the training field, to which he was already an hour and a half late, since the villagers had been slow to give up on the chase. Some of them had obviously trained as ninja at some point. Things had gone downhill almost from the moment he had taken this body. He was once the fearsome Kyuba no Kitsune, a demon so strong that the strongest ninja in existence had given his life merely to imprison him. Now he found out that he could hardly use enough of his power to beat ordinary ninja, and even then he could only use that much for a minute or two. After getting used to that, he had become a ninja to keep up his disguise as Naruto, for fear of being discovered. Since when was Kyuba afraid? And once he had done that, he had been forced to steal to have any hope of becoming stronger. Now he was not only a pathetic human, and not only a ninja of a village he had tried to destroy, but now he was a thief. And his short career in thievery had led to his current status on the bottom of the social ladder, murderer. No one knew, but that had been due only to luck. He had overheard a conversation about the missing Jounin. Not only had the Umbu found the trail to Mizuki's corpse, but they had recognized that that was where the body was. Only the presence of the wild dogs had kept the umbu from investigating further. That was way too close. Kyuubi had eaten breakfast, despite Kakashi's warning. He had planned on shopping for a while, and he figured that he would be okay after taking time to shop. He walked into the clearing of the training field. He saw Sasuke and Sakura, but no sign of Kakashi. He stopped and sniffed the air. At least I didn't lose my senses when I got this body, Kyuubi thought. His enhanced sense of smell found no trace of Kakashi, nor did his sensitive ears detect anyone other than himself and the two genin. He walked over towards the two. Where were you, Yubaka? You were supposed to have been here an hour and a half ago. Sakura screamed. Kyuba wasn't phased at all. Is Kakashi here yet? I finally got this voice down. It takes so much concentration to keep up, though. I shouldn't talk very much. Well, no, but... Kyuba sat by one of the posts in the clearing. If Kakashi wasn't here by an hour and a half after they were supposed to meet, then he was either dead, delayed by important work, or chronically late. If he didn't have a good excuse, Kyuba would plan on showing up at least an hour and a half late to every meeting Kakashi was coming to. For now, he just leaned back against the post and closed his eyes. He could feel Sakura looking at him. He checked the chakra of his genjutsu. It was as good as he could get it. His eyes were only a shade darker than Naruto's. Surely she hadn't noticed that. Kyuba scowled. Maybe she was just weird. 
he let himself drift off to sleep, since there was nothing to do. Sakura stared at Naruto. He had changed so much from when she had first met him. She remembered when he was a prankster, always smiling, always laughing, always shouting about how he was going to be Hokage. No matter how many people made fun of him, he always did whatever he felt like. Like wearing bright orange clothes. Sakura had never understood why Naruto liked orange so much. She knew very little about Naruto, but she knew enough to be aware that his food and clothing had always been bought by the Hokage, because he had no parents. She wondered how he expected to be a good ninja when his clothing was such a garish color. Without even thinking about it, she voiced her question out loud. Why do you always wear orange clothes, Naruto? Naruto didn't answer. Looking a little closer, Sakura realized that he was asleep. She could remember when he would have jumped at the opportunity to talk to Sakura-chan. She still remembered the times he had shouted at her about how orange was a great color, and how ramen was the best food ever, and anything else he could think of. But slowly, his outbursts had become less and less frequent. She had thought that he was getting a little common sense. But he had also begun to sleep in class. And he talked to people less and less, until it was rare to hear his voice. In fact, the only times she could recall him talking within the last year, was when he had either gotten in trouble, or been asked a question. And even then, his voice was quiet, and his replies were short. Sakura shook off the weight that seemed to have settled on her shoulders. At least now Naruto didn't interrupt her when she talked with Sasuke-kun. Sasuke-kun. Now that she thought of it, Naruto was a lot like Sasuke-kun now. Except Sasuke didn't sleep as much. Maybe Naruto has gotten himself a good role model, Sakura thought. And such a handsome one, too. Kakashi walked into the clearing, a full two hours late. The team was exactly as he had thought it would be. Sasuke was brooding, Sakura was staring at Sasuke, and Naruto was sleeping. Could I have possibly gotten a worse team? I have a loner, a fangirl, and a bum. Just great. Sakura jumped to her feet when she heard Kakashi arrive. You're two hours late. What's wrong with you? Oh, I was on my way here, when I noticed an elderly lady trying to cross the street dash. Liar. Kyuba was awakened by Sakura's screaming. Is she always this loud? He wondered. He had only been around her twice since being assigned to her team, and both times she had woken him with shouting of a volume that could wake the dead. Seeing that Kakashi had arrived, and that everyone else was now standing, Kyuubi got up. I'm glad you're all here. Today, we will be doing a survival test. But Kakashi-sensei, we did lots of those in the academy, Sakura whined. But this one will be harder. And if you fail, you will be sent back to the academy. What? Kakashi waited until his ears stopped ringing. Yes, don't be surprised. The final examination you took tested your ability to use techniques. This test will determine your ability to use them in a combat situation. Your goal, he pulled out two bells, each attached to a string, and put the ends of the strings into his belt. Is to get a bell by noon, using any means necessary. Those who get a bell will pass. Those who do not will be sent back to the academy. But sensei, there are only two bells, Sakura noted. Yes. So at least one of you will be going back to the academy. Kakashi pulled out an alarm clock, who knows where he had been keeping it, and set it on one of the three posts in the clearing. This clock will go off at noon. Now try and get the bells, starting now. Sasuke and Sakura each immediately leaped into the forest to hide. Kyuubi just stood where he was and stared absently at Kakashi. Kakashi is a Janin. We are Janin. Barely. I might be able to get a bell if I use my power, but there has to be a trick to this. Not one of us, in theory, should be able to even touch him. Not one of us. Ah. This is supposed to build teamwork. Then why are there only two bells? Hmm. <laughs> of course. That is to try and keep us from using teamwork. I see it now. But how can I convince the other two to work with me? Hmm. <laughs> Kakashi waited for Naruto to go hide. But he didn't. He just stood there, staring at him. What a weird kid. Maybe he's too lazy or too sleepy to hide. Whatever. 
it doesn't matter. Kakashi pulled out his favorite book, Icha Icha Paradise. He read for a little while. Isn't Naruto going to do anything? He's still staring at me. Kakashi faced away from Naruto and kept reading. He could feel the boy's gaze burning into the back of his head. He turned around, and sure enough, Naruto was still staring. I won't let a creepy genin freak me out. And what's up with his eyes? I think there's something wrong with them. Kyuubi came out of his thoughts with a start when he realized Kakashi was scrutinizing his eyes. Kakashi was ten feet away, but if he noticed the genjutsu, Kyuubi sprang into the forest to find the other genin. There's definitely something up with his eyes. It's almost like a genjutsu. But I don't think Naruto can even do a genjutsu. How weird. Sensing something behind him, Kakashi whirled around and caught a kunai between his index finger and his middle finger. Hello there, Sasuke. Kyuba found Sakura easily, since her red outfit was only slightly less noticeable than his orange one. Hey, Sakura, he whispered. Sakura spun to face him, holding a kunai. Oh, it's just you, she whispered back. Sakura, this is supposed to be a teamwork exercise. We need to work together with Sasuke to get the bells. But Kakashi Sensei said dash. Forget what he said, Kyuubi hissed. That was just to make it less obvious. Sakura thought for a moment. Yeah, he's right. Why didn't I see that? They heard a disturbance back towards the clearing. They nodded, and crept back toward the clearing to see what was happening. Sasuke scowled at Kakashi as the Jounin towered over him, smirking. Not only was Kakashi taller than Sasuke by at least a foot, but Sasuke had been buried up to his chin. Kakashi pulled his book back out and resumed reading. That had been more fun than he had thought. The boy was obviously talented, but talent wasn't important in this exercise. Kyuubi and Sakura saw Kakashi standing next to Sasuke's head. Kyuubi slapped a hand over Sakura's mouth just in time to prevent a loud Sasuke-kun from giving away their postition. After shooting Kyuubi a dirty look, Sakura realized why he had done that. Being the smartest Kunoichi in her class, she came up with a plan to get Sasuke and then have all three of them attack Kakashi. She quickly whispered the plan to Kyuubi, who made a few suggestions of his own, while still trying to speak as little as possible. Once they settled the plan, Kyuubi nodded and snuck to the designated location. Once he was in place, Sakura struck. Kakashi wondered what had happened to the other two genin. Maybe they had decided to leave. At any rate, he would wait until noon just to be sure. He continued to read his book, smirking when he heard Sasuke resume his attempt to wriggle out of the ground. Sasuke-kun. Sasuke-kun. Are you alright? Sakura burst from the edge of the forest, running towards Sasuke. Kakashi rolled his eyes. Had he seen that coming, or had he seen that coming? He walked towards Sakura, who was frantically trying to dig Sasuke out. Feeling a presence behind him, Kakashi dodged to the side and turned around. Naruto stood where Kakashi had been not even a second ago. Kakashi smirked. The boy had obviously hoped to use Sakura's outburst too. Kakashi dodged to the side to avoid a kunai from Sakura, then again to avoid one of Naruto's. Kakashi's eyes widened. Sakura only faked her outburst. Or did she just see an opportunity arise while digging? Kakashi backed up to the edge of the forest, looking at the three genin in the middle of the clearing. Naruto and Sakura finished digging out Sasuke, and then they began whispering amongst themselves. Kakashi smiled. Maybe they got the teamwork part of it, but they're still standing out in the open. Time to dodge. Kakashi moved out of the way just as a kunai whizzed past him from behind. He turned to see where it had come from. He jumped out of the way of the kunai the three genin began throwing his way. A kunai trap, perhaps? His instincts suddenly screamed for him to move, and Kakashi dodged to the side to avoid a kunai thrown from a different side. How many traps did they set up? Or maybe one of them is a bunshin, to allow the third to throw kunai from the forest. Kakashi considered opening his sherry non to see for sure, but decided against it. They're just genin. I can't go that hard on them. Suddenly the three genin in the clearing began throwing lots of kunai, and at least twice as many as they were throwing began flying out of the forest. 
Kakashi dodged around, working his way towards the genin in the middle. He knew that at least two of them were real, since normal replications had no physical substance, and therefore couldn't dig up Sasuke, whom he knew was real. Suddenly Naruto ran from his spot in the clearing straight at Kakashi. Kakashi smirked. This kid has no idea what he's in for. I'll just dodge to the side, and Kakashi suddenly realized that the genin were no longer aiming for him, but were throwing their kunai just around Naruto, to keep Kakashi from dodging. Looking back, he noticed that the kunai from directly behind him were the only ones not hemming him in towards Naruto. Those kunai were coming straight at him, and he couldn't dodge them. Naruto is going to hate me for this, Kakashi thought. He grabbed Naruto by the arm, swung him around, and used him as a shield for the kunai behind him. To Kakashi's great surprise, Naruto disappeared in cloud of smoke just before the kunai hit, allowing five of them to plant themselves into Kakashi's chest. Stunned by Naruto's disappearance and the pain of having several kunai stuck in his torso, Kakashi failed to notice Sasuke coming up behind him until the last moment. He turned and blocked Sasuke's punch and the following kick, when he felt a slight tug on his belt, looking down, he saw that the bells were gone. Sakura giggled tossed a bell to Naruto, who had just come out of the forest. She was sure that this was a teamwork exercise by now, and so was not worried about Sasuke failing. Sasuke stopped his attack and waited quietly. Kakashi stood, amazed at the work of these three genin. Uh, you guys apparently figured out the real purpose of this test, and I guess you pass. We'll meet here at 8 o'clock in two days. Now if you'll excuse me, I'm going to go see a doctor. With that, Kakashi vanished in a poof of smoke. Sakura ran over to Sasuke. Great job Sasuke. Hey, do you want to go to lunch with me to celebrate? No. Well, okay then. Naruto, I guess we could. She turned, and noticed that Naruto wasn't even there. Where'd he go? She jugged to catch up with Sasuke, who had started down the path back to Kanaha. Can I walk back with you, at least, Sasuke? Whatever. Sakura giggled. That's it for part one. Thank you for watching and see you on the next video.